All set. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're about to get started. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Eric Brown. I work here at the Institute, and I'm uh, pleased to convene this discussion with our stellar panelists. Many of them have traveled from far away to join us today to discuss uh, realizing a free and open Indo-Pacific. Given the now nearly 40 years of general peace and unprecedented prosperity that we have seen in Asia, it has become easy, perhaps, for some of us to forget the immense turmoil and violent upheaval which had preceded that period. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, many of the countries still struggling to form themselves out of the devastation of the Great Pacific War that ended in 1945 faced new existential threats as the Soviet Union and then primarily Maoist China backed revolutionary communist efforts to undermine those countries. The U.S., along with its allies, opposed this, first in Korea and then in Southeast Asia. But then at some point in the late 1970s, instead of war, a breakout of peace occurred. Maoist China collapsed, and the ruling Chinese Communist Party replaced it, its strategy with a more pragmatic external orientation intent on saving its monopoly on power at home. Soviet power was also subsequently made to recede. All this helped to create the geopolitical conditions for the 40 years peace that was backed by U.S. security guarantees and our deepening alliance of structures. This gave Asia's countries enormous new opportunities to develop their own national economies and their own political institutions to establish sovereignty. Japan led the way, rising as an economic superpower, and China facing the most benign maritime security environment it had seen in centuries was also able to begin its own economic reemergence. Far-thinking nations uh, also uh, became economic powerhouses, and uh, we saw democratic transitions in South Korea and Taiwan. Democracy, the rules-based order, etc., became the norm, whereas holdout regimes such as the one in North Korea were increasingly seen as isolated and uh, soon to be relegated to the dustbin of history. However, this decent and liberalizing order is now coming under unprecedented pressure, and the Asian peace urgently needs tending to if it is to last for another two generations. In addition to the crisis surrounding North Korea's nuclear program, the People's Republic of China is now projecting its new economic and naval power in unprecedented ways, including by pressing unfounded territorial claims in the East China Sea, the South China Sea, and elsewhere. At the 19th uh, People's Party Congress uh, uh, concluded this past October, the Belt Road Initiative was enshrined in the party's constitution. It is, as we all are aware, a breathtaking uh, uh, project in terms of its ambition and scope, which aims, aims to connect uh, a variety of countries throughout Asia with West Asia and Europe in coming decades. This kind of investment in economic activity is particularly needed and looked to with great optimism in Southeast Asia and in the Asian subcontinent, where the young, very young and dynamic countries there desperately need improved connectivity to unleash their economic potential and to continue to develop themselves economically and politically. At the same time, for a long time in Asia, it has been clear that a lot of people are nervous about this. Why? Because connectivity is not value-free. It has political and it has also strategic consequences. Over a decade ago, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan, in a visit to New Delhi, uh, delivered a speech extolling the shared values and interests between India and Japan and the confluence of the two seas. It was with that and other pronouncements by Asian leaders in particular that the concept of the united Indo-Pacific came into being. And since then, we've seen a range of new initiatives by Tokyo, by other Asian Pacific uh, powers, as well as by India, and of course also by the United States to try to give substance to this strategic concept. Um, today, These Asian countries are playing an indispensable role in preserving the order that has 
meant so many good things for them, as well as for China and for others in the region. Uh, the U.S. has asked itself, certainly since President Obama and before, about what role it can play in shoring up the now um, uh, uh, liberal and peaceful order, which is under, under pressure. Um, and at times, we've lacked a lot of clarity about how, in fact, to do this. Do we pursue an allies first policy to work with our, our special friend in Japan? Uh, and other uh, advanced capitalist democracies in the Asia Pacific um, to enlarge and to ensure that the underpinnings of national sovereignty and rule of law uh, and free and open economies are preserved. This has, after all, for 40 years, been a very effective strategy for securing the peace in the Asia Pacific. To address some of these questions and how the U.S. can engage with what has been being done already in Asia with our Asian allies, uh, we've put together, as I said, a really stellar panel of Japanese and American experts. Um, I'd like to begin today with uh, Mr. Hiroyuki Akita. He is a highly regarded commentator for our Asian affairs and on Japanese politics at the Nikkei Shimbun. Before that, he worked at the Financial Times in London and has been a correspondent both in Beijing and here in Washington, D.C. After Mr. Akita, we'll have Dr. Daniel Twining, who's recently joined the International Republican Institute as its president. Before that, as many of you know, Dan was a well-regarded commentator working at the German Marshall Fund. Um, and before that, he was in government service, serving both for, uh, as a foreign policy counselor to Senator McCain and serving on the United States State Department's policy planning staff. Next, we'll have a colleague of mine, John Balf, um, who has recently resumed his career as a banker, uh, working in mergers and acquisitions in the defense and aerospace sector. But before that, he did a lot of consulting for the U.S. Department of Defense and other government agencies here in Washington, looking at various economic and ideological aspects of competition, security competition in Asia and elsewhere. Finally, uh, after that, we'll have Dr. Satoru Nagao, who I'm happy to say has joined us here at Hudson Institute as a visiting fellow focused on U.S., Japan, India security cooperation. He has had a very interesting career uh, working with various Asian institutions and publications uh, as a researcher and a writer. He's interestingly enough also wrote his PhD on India's military strategy, which was uh, the first research thesis of its kind to be undertaken in Japan. Uh, and we're very delighted to have him here. And finally, we'll have my <coughs> dear colleague, uh, Ambassador Hussein Haqqani, our whip today. Um, Hussein doesn't need much of an introduction here at the Institute, but in his career as a journalist, diplomat, and scholar, I'll only say that Hussein has courageously and oftentimes at great personal risk embodied and lived the central Confucian teaching for establishing order and justice and peace, and that is to call things by their right names. Um, so with that, if I could begin with you, Akita. -san. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, for, uh, Eric, for inviting me to this important event. And I'm very honored to be here at the Harrison Institute. I'm also uh, honored to be at the very prestigious, prestigious location that is just in front of Trump Hotel. <laughs> we are very close to the center of the power. So maybe uh, I will start. <laughs> yes. I'll use a PowerPoint. So maybe I stand here and stand. So in my, in my uh, opening remarks, which is maybe about uh, a little bit around 10 minutes or 12 minutes, I'd like to make three points. One is about the concept of Indo-Pacific strategy to achieve free and open in the Pacific, and the concept as I understand. And secondly, <clears throat> uh, what is the concrete measures that uh, we should adapt to push for this strategy? And thirdly, and most importantly, uh, two key challenges this strategy will face. So first three, uh, this is, oh, sorry. So this is a map on, of <clears throat> in the Pacific. Basically, concept, concept is that U.S. and its allies or partners, such as Japan or India and Australia and other countries, join together to maintain free and rule-based maritime order in Indian Pacific and also uh, freedom of navigation should be sustained. 
And in order to do that, another aspect is to establish uh, port facilities, uh, which is open to everybody, so that we can uh, uh, conduct maritime uh, uh, cooperation and so on. And of course, the Japanese government never say it openly, but the hidden agenda is to provide alternative to China's Belt and Road Initiative, as you can see in the Pacific, uh, more or less in geographical overlap. In the, in the Pacific uh, strategy, more or less overlap to that of uh, China's initiative. And also, uh, China's initiative goes like this, so we can, thank you, we can uh, understand how India feels. They are, I traveled to India last October and they are getting more nervous about that. So then question is what, is, what concept is uh, clear, but uh, what kind of a concrete measures we should adopt? I think there are uh, one uh, pillar is, of course, to sustain maritime safety and freedom of navigation in the maritime domain. In order to do that, maybe two concrete measures are the keys. One is uh, supporting Asian countries to boost maritime security capability, especially Coast Guard. And many ASEAN countries have established Coast Guard, but their capacity is, unfortunately, much uh, far from sufficient to deal with the challenges in South China Sea, for example. So should uh, US, Japan, Australia, India, other countries should get together to uh, help them to build their capacity. And secondly, uh, maybe it is more also important to increase joint naval exercise and strategic port visit by US, Japan, Australia, India, and other partners to maintain a naval presence in the Indian Pacific in order to maintain rule-based order. So this is a picture of uh, Japan and the Philippines Coast Guard joint exercise, uh, which was conducted last June. And Japan have um, provided, provided uh, patrol vessels to, uh, by using foreign aid to Philippines and uh, Malaysia and Indonesia and Vietnam. It is a very modest contribution, but uh, also it's very significant because they didn't have so many paddle vessels. So for example, this uh, paddle vessels uh, is provided from Japan to Philippines, and now they are using it to conduct patrol, sea patrol on the area of the Scarborough shore, where they have a dispute against China and where they couldn't, you know, conduct patrol, effective patrol person. And also, this is a picture of the helicopter carrier uh, ISMO in Japanese uh, Self-Defense Forces' uh, biggest uh, carrier port visit Philippines last June. You can see the picture of uh, President Duterte here, uh, together with the Foreign Minister of Japan. So I'm sure that the U.S. is conducting this kind of port visit, also joint exercise very actively, as well as maybe Australia and India. So uh, strategy is to do it more, to do it to closely, to closely coordinate this kind of activities in the context of uh, uh, strategy, in the Pacific strategy, so that we can maintain uh, balance of power, maritime balance of power in the region. And another uh, pillar is to, of course, as I said, uh, build uh, port facilities and improve the connectivities in this region. And in order to do that, we need uh, money. So later we will discuss about it. So anyway, uh, this is one example that Japan is uh, doing. Uh, together with ASEAN country, Japan is pushing for a blue one is a east-west economic corridor, uh, try to connect a two port, uh, Vietnam and uh, Myanmar. And red one is uh, called Southern Economic Corridor, which connects uh, Vietnam and Myanmar port. Uh, actually, China is doing it more actively. And Japan is trying to provide alternative. 
uh, as, as well as uh, this one, this is another example. Uh, Japan, India, Myanmar, Thailand uh, are cooperating each other to you know, build this uh, railway. So a uh, concept is clear, but uh, I think this is more, more importantly, there is a two major, there are many challenges, but there are two major challenges. One is how to incorporate ASEAN members and also other Asian countries to this strategy. The second one is how to find fund infrastructure project. So first challenge is more serious, I think. Uh, I traveled to ASEAN countries uh, three times uh, last year to discuss about uh, their perception of this uh, strategy. They are w welcoming this in the Pacific strategy, but uh, they also say that, oh, we are heavily relying on China economically. For example, this is uh, as ASEAN countries export to China and the US. And uh, dark blue is to China, and light blue is to US. You can see the trend. And uh, their reliance on China market is getting bigger and bigger. And this is just one example of the, their increasing reliance on the China, uh, Chinese market, and also ch reliance on China as a source of uh, capital to build infrastructure. So that uh, reflects, that also ch uh, change affect the, their China perception. This is a poll result conducted by Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs last spring. And they asked, they conducted uh, polls at every ASEAN country, 10 ASEAN countries, and asked what is the most important partner. And as you can see, China. Unfortunately, China comes top. Uh, Brunei, Cambodia, naturally. And in the, uh, Indonesia, uh, China comes third. Uh, second, interestingly enough, Saudi is the second most important partner. And Malaysia, China, and Ma Malaysia think that the U.S. is the third most important partner. Then uh, another five countries, you can see U.S., uh, but still China maintains big presence. And when they asked, Paul asked, most, who is, which country is most reliable friend? China. And also in Brunei, Saudi is most reliable, regarded as most reliable friend. In, 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 in Indonesia, Saudi comes second. Then China. And then in these countries, uh, they uh, uh, think that the U.S. is highly reliable partner, but the, as you can see, China also. So they are not only relying on China unwillingly, but they started to think that China is a very important and also reliable partner. So uh, yeah, this is uh, just uh, one of the journalistic uh, illustration. Uh, so left is pro-China and uh, right is anti-China. So they are divided. This is an obstacle for US and Japan, India, Australia to incorporate these countries to the strategy and push forward together with them. And another uh, uh, challenge is how to an infrastructure project. This is a graphic, uh, this graphic shows the growth of expansion of Chinese foreign aid. And this, and the red is China's overseas aid, and blue one is the US. As you can see, there uh, scale is as, as, as surpassing that of the U.S. Actually, uh, when you and this is a China and U.S. Uh, foreign aid, and the dark blue one is official foreign aid, and the gray one is a uh, non a you know, uh, unofficial foreign aid, uh, which includes the state fund by China. China, China has many foundation to provide uh, capitals to build infrastructure project, mainly led by state enterprises. So official foreign aid, US is much bigger. But in total, China's foreign aid, de facto foreign aid is much bigger. So this is a challenge if we, we want to provide alternative to China's initiative. So 
lastly, my conclusion is this, three conclusions. Uh, one is, uh, in order to achieve, push forward uh, in the Pacific strategy effectively, uh, worst way to do is to force ASEAN countries and other as country, Asian countries to force, force or ask them to choose either China's, either China pro initiative or us in the Pacific strategy. They, they cannot choose. They want both. And secondly, maybe we should uh, firmly uphold rule-based principle, but do not necessarily exclude China as a potential partner if, if they respect principle of rule-based order. <coughs> if they do, if they do. <laughs> and then thirdly, uh, since we need the money, uh, so maybe it should open the door for cooperation with China on the infrastructure project, on a project-to-project -project basis, if they also agreed uh, our principle, which is the project have to be conducted very transparent manner and also you know, rule-based. So that is my three conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dan. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm delighted to be here at Hudson with so many friends. Ken, uh, Ambassador Hakani, uh, Scooter, um, so much talent here, so much energy. I love to come here because I think it makes me a little better and think a little smarter about these issues. My friend Hiro, we were last in Tokyo together. I always learn so much from you. Uh, He's so thank very you. good at the flood running. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It's all true. So look, I, so this is unflattering, but India was missing from your presentation. Oh, yeah, so I'm yeah, now yeah, going yeah. to fill in that space. Um, and I would just like to start with just a minute. I would like us all just to imagine India in 30 years. And my kind of great theory is that the next 30 years will be really an Indian story, just like the last 30 years were a China story, right? Um, and I think this is the most exciting thing happening out there in the world. If I had to make a list, I would put India number one, and I would put what's happening in Africa number two. Mm. Uh, Africa, you're looking at a situation in 2050 where you're going to have 80% of Africans, 2 billion people by 20, before 2050, under age 25. And that just, to me, is very exciting, just that prospect of kind of a youth-driven dynamism in a resource-rich continent with mixed governance but some really good stories. Anyway, uh, India. So uh, I think the most exciting story of the next 30 is the most exciting growth story, and of course, of course a, a very exciting governance story, uh, which doesn't mean that India is perfectly governed. It's to say that really the fact that this country is such a robust and thriving democracy, I think has just enormous grand strategic consequences when we talk about a free and open Indo-Pacific, and, and by extension, a free and open world. Uh, I think the United States, Japan, other countries, ASEAN, would be in a conundrum if India did not exist, because I think then there might be more credence to the Chinese argument that the only way to govern 1.3 billion people is through authoritarian control and total surveillance. And, you know, it's just manifestly not true. India is a living example of the fact that that is manifestly not true, right? So that's, that's just the first kind of thought point. The sub-point here, strategically, is I think we all have come of age in a period when India was poor and weak and somewhat isolated geopolitically, somewhat self-isolated geopolitically, and that's changing. Uh, this was India's ocean until 1945, essentially. Uh, there was an Indian world that stretched from the Persian Gulf, the eastern coastline of Africa, over into uh, the Straits of Malacca and the East China Sea. The British Empire, if the Germans had taken the British Isles, the British would have kept fighting with the resources and manpower of Canada, the Dominions, and India. India was the centerpiece of Britain's global strategy. And so I mention this not to show off the fact that I've read a history book or two, but just I think we need to think about India a little differently than most of us do. And that is what's so exciting about the Indo-Pacific concept and the century we are looking out at, is to have a strong and dynamic partner there in the form of India. Uh, point two, uh, 
I'm sorry I need to say this, but apparently I do. There is a link between governance and security. We have a strategic mm -hmm. problem in this region because of a rising superpower that is under authoritarian control. And I think it's not controversial that the way a country treats its people is perhaps reflected somewhat in the way it treats its neighbors and engages with the international system. That apparently is a controversial proposition. I'm not sure why. And so the work we're doing, but really I think what we all need to engage with strategically, is that it really matters how countries are governed, right? Uh, I mean, as some of the weaknesses within ASEAN reflect poor governance, misgovernance, governance gaps. Uh, some of the countries who want to work very closely with us in this space, like Vietnam, uh, our cooperation will be limited by the nature of their government, which doesn't mean they can't be friends and partners of a sort, but we will never maximize the potential of those partnerships as long as uh, countries are not free and open and responsive to their publics. Uh, also, I would note that, of course, where, where countries like China, also Russia in, in places like Ukraine, where they have made the greatest gains and had success through influence operations, leveraging infrastructure into political power, uh, they have made the greatest gains in countries that are poorly governed. And again, I'm not sure why we even need to make these points, but it seems we do, because I think some of this is just missing from the debate, that you know, the fact is it is much easier for China to wield influence in a country like Rajapaksa's Sri Lanka a few years ago, or in a weak democracy like Nepal, it is much easier for China wield, to wield unhelpful forms of influence there than it is in countries that are well governed. Uh, and so I think we should all just pay a little more attention to kind of this democratic capacity issue. Point three, you know, uh, China exercises soft power in entirely appropriate ways. If you like Chinese opera, uh, uh, Chinese film, whatever, uh, that's perfectly fine. Uh, China also exercises evident hard power in the form of its dramatic military buildup, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's now this emerging consensus around this third form of really sharp power, which is maybe not the perfect term, but which is a reflection of influence operations, the uh, undue leverage that countries like China, not just country, but countries like China gain through these massive investments, through sometimes uh, corrupt forms of engagement inside of other countries, including strong democracies like Australia and New Zealand, right? So it's not just weak uh, states that suffer. Uh, strong states are the target of influence operations, including by China, including by Russia. So I don't mean to keep picking on China. Um, but really, we all need to be very attuned, as I think many of us are now becoming, to this question of sharp power and foreign influence operations. Uh, and beware of the fact that it's not simply about military spreadsheets showing relative balances, right? That in this emerging competitive arena, which is the 21st century, and I think the White House is right, right to define it as a competitive arena, this world out there, that there is a new toolkit of power and influence, and we need to catch up. And I think, you know, there would be a very useful strategic conversation to have in the United States about our own competitiveness and how we sharpen the tools in that toolkit. And you know, again, I think the tools include support for democracy and governance and some of the development work that the United States does. But we should just have our eyes wide open there. Uh, finally, it goes without saying, this is my last point, that a free and open Indo-Pacific is the basis for a free and open world. I think this, this area we are talking about is going to be the central arena of competition and cooperation in the world in the decades ahead. And therefore, it matters disproportionately in a way that, say, the European balance mattered disproportionately for the last few centuries. This is where it's going to count. And that's why we are lucky to have such a strong ally in Japan. That's why we are lucky to have a vigorous, rising democratic partner in a country like India. And the more we can do to knit these networks together, uh, the better we will all be. And I'll end with you know, a point um, in the Bush administration, first national security strategy, uh, there was this term, you know, the goal of American grand strategy is essentially to create a balance of power that favors freedom. And I must say, uh, I guess that's out of fashion too, but I quite like the concept because our whole premise is that countries should be free to choose. And I think countries like the US, Japan, India are quite confident that if countries are really free to choose, they will choose to associate and align and partner with us. Uh, and that is our uh, great comparative advantage at the end of the day. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. John. Eric, thank you for that very kind introduction. You bet. <laughs> uh, so how might we counter the national strategy mobilized in China's 
one belt, one road. I understand the nomenclature is a little behind the curve, OBOR initiative, using our asymmetric economic advantages. I think the argument is straightforward. Many Chinese OBOR projects that satisfy China's strategic concerns do not match the needs and desires of the customers. There is only overlap, and they, all, <clears throat> excuse me, and they always come with commercially unjustified terms. Indian, Japanese, and American companies are commercially driven and, ideally, don't come with agendas beyond generating an acceptable profit and meeting customer needs and desires. Another distinction is that in open tenders, Chinese companies compete on price. Japanese and American companies compete on quality. They can't afford to do otherwise. Indian companies can bring access to a huge market uh, that provides a welcome counterweight to China's. Many OBOR infrastructure projects are primarily commercially driven, but some are not. Obviously, an infrastructure project is rarely identifiable as economically sensible or not. Classifying most involves judgment calls. Still, some are clearly economically unsound, only justifiable by China's national strategy. An easy example of one of these clearly dubious uh, projects is the Hamban Tota port in Sri Lanka's southern coast. Built with 3.1 billion borrowed from China, the port never came close and never will be close to generating the business necessary to support the loan. The debt was restructured and an SOE, China Merchant Port Holdings, now owns 70% with a 99 year lease and that lease will be used to repay the loan, restructured but still out there. This project makes sense if you're looking for a militarily capable port. It makes no sense if you're trying to build a profitable enterprise. In general, judging the economic utility of an infrastructure project is notoriously difficult. It can take decades for infrastructure projects to generate acceptable returns. According to one credible analysis, the first ship traversed the Panama Canal in 1913, but it wasn't profitable until the 1950s. China Railways Corporation today appears to be a black hole of capital loss. As standalone ventures, these are catastrophes, but viewed as national assets, the canal was, and China's rail system likely will be, transformational, strongly positive for their economies. There's every reason to think that many of China's proposed rail systems and ports in South and East Asia will have similar benefits, but even against the properly broad economic background, the right question for everyone involved is, who bears the costs and who gets the benefits? For the Panama Canal, the answer was the U.S. and the U.S. For participants in China's OBOR vision, there's the problem. The value proposition for the countries involved is, do the net benefits primarily accrue to greater China or to the participating countries ex-China? One example is the acrimonious negotiations to build a rail system connecting China to Thailand and the rest of Southeast Asia. It was to have been financed with Thai rice. The terms made great sense if the fundamental drivers are to employ Chinese, soak up overcapacity, and to bring low value added goods like rice to China. The ori original plans made much less sense if the aim is to build up the Thai domestic economy. Agreed terms were inked only after Thailand was able to finance this project on its own, bring its own workforce to the project, bring its own materials to the project. China has been reduced to providing high-speed rail intellectual property. Here we have Thai costs for Thai benefits. For parallel reasons, in the last couple of months, Myanmar, Nepal, and Pakistan have canceled $20 billion worth of hydropower projects. While the particulars in each instance differ, the general objection was that the terms were too onerous and domestic political considerations too unfavorable given China's method of doing business. Of course, China can point to a very long string of successes. It has built a portfolio of competencies like high-speed rail and dam construction. It can mobilize capital, <coughs> and it makes very few demands on transparency, or what it cynically calls the internal affairs of other countries. From an economic point of view, however, its decisive attraction is the Chinese market. Of course, 
ASEAN countries are going to want infrastructure that makes trade with China more efficient. This gives China an asymmetric advantage in determining the course of infrastructure development insofar as the infrastructure is in support of trade. This doesn't mean that Chinese companies and investors will build all of this infrastructure, but the overall structure of regional infrastructure development will be determined by trade volumes and destinations. This overall structure is what will deliver many of the strategic benefits China is seeking through OBOR. There are ways to diminish this advantage. I don't remember the company that used this slogan, but all its materials would say, an educated consumer is our best customer. This should be a guiding principle for us. China competes on price. We compete on quality. Japanese or American companies will rarely be the low-cost bidder, at least so far as the headline price is concerned. However, as seen before, the ties took a closer look at the full financing costs implicit in the original Rice for Rails deal and saw that the implicit rate of interest in the deal was unacceptable. Thailand could get a better deal on the open market. Chinese companies also don't complete projects on time, on budget, or to the terms of delivery nearly as often as American or Japanese companies. This typically imposes a huge implicit cost. Finally, the total cost of a project is often backloaded. The maintenance and repair of infrastructure over the decades can cost more than the original construction. Modeling the national economic benefits of a particular infrastructure project is extremely difficult. Programs to impart these skills would go a long way towards sparing the Thais, the Burmese, or Pakistanis years of negotiation over fundamentally flawed deals. Such training programs, properly constructed, should also serve to build relationships between officials from our governments and the target bank markets with the bankers, lawyers, and others require, with the required specialized skills. Just as militaries have officer exchange programs, joint drills, and invitations to academies, so too should we have parallel programs for evaluating and managing infrastructure tenders. This can deliver substantial national strategic benefits. The, the Hanbantota port in Sri Lanka should never have been built, and perhaps a better financial analysis might have prevented that. Perhaps not. There was a lot of corruption involved. But at least going through a proper analysis would have made the decision more difficult to justify. And educate, there are other examples in Latin America and Asia and Africa where things look cheap that in fact are not. A well-educated consumer might spare us the strategic problem of confronting a port or rail system that makes no economic sense but makes excellent military sense. Another area where we should compete is in smaller scale projects that can be contracted and financed as a group. Coastwise trade, shipping goods from port to port within a country, is very important to the economies of most ZAN nations, as well as for India and Bangladesh. The ports used and the road networks supporting them could almost certainly all use modernization and upgrade, but individually the amounts of money are too small to justify separate negotiations for each little project. Having a government-to-government -government program to create a single contract structure and financing vehicle to upgrade the coastwise trade infrastructure of a nation should generate enormous economic growth and goodwill locally and at the national level. Strategically, this could diminish China's ability to dictate the national policy of other nations due to its economic dominance. Stronger local economies that do not necessarily directly depend on China's economy could help balance against the economic pull of trade with China. The final, and in certain respects, the most important area where we have an asymmetric advantage is access to the Indian market. For exporters to India, a major impediment is just the sheer lack of proper infrastructure. Plans for modern freight lines from Kolkata up to Delhi, across to Mumbai, and down to Chennai were approved years ago, yet remain unbuilt. Assistance in financing the modernization of the rail system would make the Indian market much more attractive, and right now the biggest impediment is buying out the owners of the land where the rail system would go, so they can certainly use financing assistance. 
All of this would enable an outreach policy long desired by India, its Go East initiative. The most promising aspect of this plan is a maritime route from Chennai to Dawei in Myanmar with a rail connection to Bangkok and on to Ho Chi Minh City. East-West trade along this line would be a huge benefit to all involved and relieve some of the pressure for Thailand and Vietnam to focus so intently on trade with China. China is currently negotiating plans to turn Dawei into a dedicated petrochemical facility producing product for consumption in Myanmar. There would be no rail line going to Bangkok and Ho Chi Minh City. Trade would remain north-south, China-centric. This could be understood as another step in a campaign to economically isolate India from East Asia. If India can connect Chennai with the rest of the Indian subcontinent in a commercially acceptable way, a contest for the development of Dawei between India and Japan on one side and China on the other would be a next logical step. Giving the nations of ASEAN growth opportunities beyond those presented by China is critical to offering a real alternative to OBOR. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Nagal. Yeah. I need to... Thank you. Thank you very much to, to giving a chance to make a perfect presentation by using completely broken English. <laughs> so that is the reason the most of... Uh, all of the sentences written in PowerPoint. So, so when you cannot understand my uh, English, uh, could you please read? <laughs> and I am Japanese. Japan, most cases, Japanese presentation start from apologies. So the explanation about English is my chapter one, apologies. So now the, we need to enter the chapter two. The title of my presentation is Security Aspect of Japan-India Infrastructure Project. So today, further cooperation in security relations between Japan and India is increasingly possible, like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, important point is infrastructure project. The Northeast India, the Andaman Nicobar Island in India, and the Trinkumari Port in Sri Lanka, the Chabahar port in Iran, and the Asia Africa Growth Corridor in Africa, of course. Uh, why? Why so friendly? Ah, why is? Yes. <laughs> so the most relevant feature of the, this project is that this project uh, developed after China launched a similar infrastructure project in similar area. For example, the Indochina border area, China is um, improving infrastructure that side of northeast of India. And uh, as a case, the Strait of Malacca related infrastructure project is related with Japan's Andaman Nicobar Island in India's project. And the uh, Hambantota port, after that, so we suggest Trinkumari port. And, uh, and the 100 kilometers from the Guadal port, we can find the Chabahar port in Iran. And in Africa, uh, you have already known China is investing bus. So how are China's infrastructure project and Japan and the collaboration related? So this is the con uh, question that I need to solve in this presentation. So example is North East India, Trinkumari Port in Sri Lanka, and Chabad Port in Iran. So where is, you can, you can see it in the map, the North East India is located to North East India. That's true. But just side of the Indochina border area. So the main purpose of Japan's road project is the promotion of economic development in the local area, so Northeast India. But if road connections are made to increasing in the Southeast Asia trade, the possibility is that growing in the Southeast Asian trade could mitigate China's influence in the Southeast Asia. And in addition, Indian Army can deploy more force and supply to the border area by using this road. So how about Trinkumari port in Sri Lanka? You can see the Trinkumari port just side of the Colombo and the Hambantota in Sri Lanka. So the, we need to talk about Hambantota first. China's Hambantota port has a weak point. What is a weak point? Few commercial ships use Hambantota port because no large city. 
So if there were a big city near the port, ship can use the port to unload carrying cargo to consuming area, this is city. And if there were a big city, ship crew could rest before proceeding to another destination. Instead of the hub and the port, most ship use the Colombo port, because Colombo. However, because hub and the port is located near sea lane of communication, the port can be used as a naval port. That is a concern. Both Japan and India express a concern about this project. So how about Trincomalee port? Like Hambanto, the port Trincomalee has no connection with Colombo. Indeed, there's no big city indeed. But Japan has the Trincomalee-Colombo economic corridor project or connected to port. And furthermore, the sea depth is greater than the 25 major, which is sufficient for all conventional and naval ships, including U.S. nuclear aircraft carrier. Simply said, U.S., India, Japan can show naval presence by using Trincomalee port. So in addition, Trincomalee project promotes the local economy of east side, which was destroyed during the civil war by 2009. So if the Trincomalee port project succeeded, then the importance of Hanban to the port for Sri Lanka will decline. Chabahar port. Well, uh, so the, the map is a little different because Chabahar port is located uh, just side of the Gwadar port in Pakistan, but connected with Central Asia. So that is the reason a little different. Japan and India also collaborate to modernize the Chabahar port project in Iran. The possibility exists that Chabahar port project should mitigate the importance of China's Gwadar port in Pakistan because two ports have competitive location. When the central country need to find a route to export the energy resources through the Indian Ocean, the China-made Pakistan route is the most important route currently. However, Chabahar port can change the situation. Chabahar port is located 100 west of Gravadao, so this port project creates Turkmenistan-Iran, Afghanistan-Iran route. That would be a good choice for Central Asian countries. So conclusion, China's infrastructure project related with the fogging and military policies, which is a concern for countries such as Japan and India. So as a result, Japan and India have started to collaborate. Along with China's project, Japan and India cooperation has spread from Asia to Africa. So the event, the bright future, or the dark one, will depend on the strength of achievement Japan, India, and the United States Collaboration can show to the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. For, thank you. Uh, Ambassador Hakami. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eric, and all the other uh, participants. Um, uh, much has been said, so I'm just going to do a bit of a summary uh, and uh, talk about what essentially is uh, the discussion about a free and peaceful uh, Indo-Pacific region. Uh, what is the threat? And it's clear that everybody <clears throat> in this panel uh, recognizes that China's peaceful rise is no longer peaceful, uh, that there will be a potential challenge by China uh, to not only American interests, but to the interests of other powers in the region, and that China will and is already working on seeking advantage in this vast region that stretches all the way from the Indian Ocean uh, into the Pacific. Uh, it is also able to take advantage of two major factors. One is that the democracies, the economy of the democ uh, the economies of the democracies uh, are not growing at as fast a rate as China's economy has grown. So China has uh, resources to spend uh, on countries that have uh, limited ambitions uh, that want uh, an upgrading of their uh, infrastructure, uh, and that China is able to use that desire for an upgradation of infrastructure to lure smaller countries, for example, Sri Lanka, Nepal was mentioned, into uh, <clears throat> their uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, they are also able to uh, build projects that do not necessarily have to be commercially viable. Uh, at least in the short term. Uh, they are also not bound by laws and rules that uh, uh, democracies have enacted against corruption. 
Uh, so, for example, one of the only explanations for uh, the Humban Tota port that I have been able to come to is that the charges of corruption involving the political leaders of Sri Lanka, uh, who were at that time making the decision to build the Humban Tota port, even though their own experts said that this may not be commercially viable, the only plausible explanation is corruption. Uh, politicians making money for themselves, uh, allowing their country to be indebted to China. And we may have a similar situation emerging in Pakistan with the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, and it will probably be repeated and replicated in other places. So the fact that the economies of the major democracies, the United States, Japan, etc., have not been growing uh, is actually a security challenge in some ways. And therefore, uh, the Trump, Trump administration's assertion that they really want the economic growth to go back to higher levels, uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Abe's desire to reignite uh, growth in Japan's economy. These are crucial factors, even as we plan or look forward to having a, a comprehensive strategy for the Indo-Pacific. Second, China is also able to take advantage of the revisionist ambitions of regional powers. So, for example, North Korea. The reason why China has maintained relations with North Korea for as long as it has done is not just because North Korea uh, shares a border with China. Other countries share a border with China. India does. That hasn't made China more responsive to uh, a closer relationship with India of the same nature that they have with North Korea. No. The fact is that China is creating or building North Korea as a secondary deterrent for Japan and South Korea in uh, East Asia. Uh, similarly, China's original investment in Myanmar was also the whole notion of a secondary deterrent, having a satellite that can be depended upon in its region with its own ambitions. And so China has done that much better than the democracies have done so far, at least in the Asian region, understanding who are the ambitious powers, what their local ambition is, and then making those powers recognize or feel that China will be supportive of those ambitions. Uh, the third, of course, is Pakistan. Pakistan is also a revisionist power. It is not, ex uh, it is not uh, happy with the status quo in South Asia and wants to be the preeminent power of uh, South and Central Asia, uh, which puts it in competition with India. And it is very useful for China as a secondary deterrent because it keeps uh, India, which would otherwise be China's natural rival, to end up being considered even to this day in the India-Pakistan context uh, uh, by many people. <clears throat> so that is quite clearly the way China, the direction China is taking. How does one deal with a rising power that may have ambitions uh, that uh, could be threatening to the interests of others, uh, and especially when it is an authoritarian power, as uh, um, Dan rightly pointed out? Um, and can always help build up other authoritarian uh, allies, satellites, and proxies. Um, first, I think there has to be clarity of vision on the part of the major democracies of the region. Uh, the United States is a Pacific power, but it has spent more time and energy dealing with North Atlantic issues for a long time. So NATO was the instrument of creating the architecture for European security, and it has maintained the peace for, for a long time in Europe. Uh, I think that a new architecture is needed for Indo-Pacific security. And the United States needs to take the lead on that. It may not necessarily be a uh, uh, Pacific treaty organization. Uh, it, 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 it's not going to be a reincarnation of NATO as PETO, or, and, and, and it's not going to be... Uh, uh, an expansion of NATO by including uh, India and Japan, but it will have to be focused on the region, considering how everybody has their own uh, limits on exercising power or uh, signing up for alliances. Japan has its constitutional limitation on uh, the kind of military they can build up. India has its own limitation of a principle of not signing up for uh, treaties and alliances in a formal manner, military alliances, and they want to go case by case and event by event. So all of that has to be taken into consideration and see if there can be what Prime Minister Abe calls the strategic diamond, the United States, Japan, Australia, and India 
as the critical partners for the Indo-Pacific, then signing on other allies. Now, we will have a problem with ASEAN, where still there is a romance with China, uh, having looked upon China as a threat in the 50s and 60s and even 70s, the ASEAN countries have kind of developed this notion that nah, 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 there's no threat. But we all know from history that those who believe that there is no threat are often the first ones uh, to be gobbled by that threat. We saw that in Europe, uh, in case of uh, uh, Czechoslovakia and Poland. Uh, and uh, the ASEAN countries would have to definitely review in Japan, India and the United States in particular have a role to play here in making the ASEAN countries more aware of how they may actually play a part or a role in Indo-Pacific architecture for security without necessarily provoking China. I don't think anybody wants to provoke China. I don't think anybody is looking to uh, uh, fight with China or to start talking about containing China uh, without, uh, 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 without getting or continuing with the benefits that the world has had of China's growth. But I think it would be unrealistic uh, to think that China's recent moves, uh, many of which are strategic and not just purely economic, uh, can be ignored forever. And so the future of the Indo-Pacific uh, depends on the democracies in the region creating a uh, an architecture for security, uh, a consensus for that security, and a recognition of the threats to that security. I think I'll stop there because we would like the audience to become part of the discussion as well, Eric. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if I might, a, a couple of quick questions for the panel before we open it up for uh, a larger discussion. Um, the scramble clearly to connect Asia is on. Uh, it has begun. Um, and yet, over the last decade, when I speak to colleagues and friends, both in India and Japan, and certainly in ASEAN countries, there's a growing um, concern that the US hasn't had the same level of strategic clarity about this scramble to connect Asia that many Asian uh, capitals, I think, have the Asian democracies in particular, have exhibited over the last decade. This may be an unfair question for our Japanese colleagues, but what do you expect um, from the new Trump administration? And what, will, what, in your view, will help to reassure our allies in Asia <coughs> um, that we're in it for the long run and that we're willing to run this marathon with our allies first? I'm sure that uh, we can never uh, you know, uh, have this discussion without mentioning President, name of President Trump, yeah. maybe 10 times or 10 times. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, actually, uh, Japan, Asian democratic countries like Japan, Australia, or India, and also several other Asian countries especially, really wants the U.S. to maintain primacy in the Asian Pacific. Because we are the beneficiary, and we also we share the democratic value. But what we see is that uh, China is not only rising as a great power, but China is trying to s replace U.S.-led order in the Asian Pacific or in, in the Pacific region. And uh, BRI, Belt and Road Project Initiative, as we observe from Tokyo, is a very important tool for them to expand the sphere of influence, not only economic sphere of influence, but the political sphere of influence also and try to expand their state model, maybe, right. to, uh, by uh, deepening its cooperation uh, politically and economically. So what uh, Japan expects uh, Trump administration, as well as other uh, Asian dem democratic country, is one thing. Uh, please keep engaging Asian Pacific. Uh, especially wants the U.S. to maintain military presence in the region uh, while China is expanding its naval uh, presence, especially in South China Sea or East China Sea. And secondly, uh, another engagement is economic engagement. And the TPP was supposed to be a framework right. to uh, maintain 
it to be an important tool for U.S. and other allies or partners to maybe counter uh, China's economic initiative. And I'm not sure that the people here in the room are supportive of it, TPP or not, but the Japan is supportive because not, on, not because uh, it benefits uh, economically for Japan, but it is a tool to maintain or expand U.S.-led order yeah. uh, based on a democracy and rule-based in the Asian region. So uh, hope is that Japan is now negotiating TPP with except the U.S. and maybe will establish framework TPP 11, and then put this in a refrigerator. So hope that U.S. will come back to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this TPP framework as a strategic framework yeah. to deal with China, rise of China. Well, thank you for keeping that alive. I mean, the TPP <laughs> was a key component of President Obama's pivot to Asia, and uh, the strategic rationale behind it was key and sound, but it was dead on arrival by the time it reached Congress, and um, then President Trump uh, took the opportunity to kill it again uh, when he came um, to office. Um, uh, from the perspective of a lot of congressional members, uh, people in Congress today, it doesn't make a lot of economic logic. But I think that there is a hope that there will be some spirited rounds of bilateral uh, uh, trade negotiations that will come out of the Trump administration in the next year. Beyond that, the hope, too, is once our domestic economy, uh, assuming that it does continue to, to pick up and we have the repatriation of more money from abroad, if it can grow at 3 possibly even 4% a year, you might find that political opposition to TPP will decline here um, in the U.S. That's a hopeful analysis, at least. But I agree. It was a massive strategic loss to see TPP uh, not get enacted. Um, uh, we talked about it as if it was the equivalent of NAFTA, when in fact it was part of a, of a U.S. strategic policy. Um, thank you. Um, Beyond that, I wanted to go back to something that Dan had mentioned about the connection between governance and security. It reminded me of an observation that Rabindranath Tagore had, had made way back when, when he was thinking about the fissures and the fault lines within South Asia that made a continent of that size and that dynamism uh, vulnerable to being colonized by a faraway imperial power. He had said, uh, Satan cannot enter until he finds a flaw. Um, it was obviously a very literary way of describing uh, exactly what Dan was getting at. Um, uh, governance and security really matter. And while we here in the U.S. are doing a lot of better job of appreciating the threat that sharp power poses, we have yet to really devolve the strategies and tools required to meet a hybrid offense with a proper hybrid defense. And my question for Dan and for John, who connected financial literacy and education to our ongoing efforts to build democratic capacity. My question for the two of you is, what more can we be doing? I mean, there's a concern in a way that some of America's soft engagements in building democratic capacity has fallen off the radar. Um, I think people are coming to question uh, the original um, uh, urge to curtail some of those activities. Uh, what do you think uniquely can be done in the Indo-Pacific, both by the United States and in conjunction with our allies, to build real hybrid defense and real democratic capacity for countries that are now struggling to maintain their sovereignty and also avail themselves of the range of economic opportunities that are presenting to them? Thank you. I mean, the first thing is we shouldn't be playing defense. Uh, Everywhere I go, people want to live in a free and open world. So we somehow shouldn't be in a crouch thinking that we are wrong or our values are weak or somehow we are, uh, we are somehow amiss by talking about things like democratic order in developing societies, right? Uh, because that is how one modernizes. Uh, so the first is we shouldn't be playing defense. The second is uh, I think our friends should do more. Japan should create a Japanese endowment for democracy. I don't think Japan is going to compete with China in Asia by building better bridges, right? Um, I mean, Japan, indust Japan created a lot of the original infrastructure in more developed parts of Southeast Asia, but I think the game has changed. 
And if I were sitting in Tokyo thinking about how to allocate scarce government resources, I would think about some of the soft capital investments that would change the equation in some of these countries, yeah. right? Uh, third, uh, I think there is a new way to talk about these issues, which relates to an old Asian post-colonial concern, mm -hmm. which is about the protection of sovereignty, mm -hmm. right? Every time, I mean, everything I've ever read about ASEAN is all about the preservation of state sovereignty. And there were dangers to that. Obviously, that was a legacy of European colonialism. There was a perception during the Cold War that the US was a challenger to so sovereignty of Asian countries. Um, but guess what? There's a different challenger now, and it's not anyone in the West or in Japan, which, of course, was another challenger when it uh, colonized parts of Asia. So. Uh, the conversation about sovereignty in Asia, as in Africa and elsewhere now, does relate to some of these foreign influences that are unwelcome and unhealthy, and which often empower corrupted elites at the expense of publics who really don't like that. And so I think there is a way to connect very directly that this is not any kind of Western imposition. These are not Western values. We, like you, want to help you Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, etc., strengthen your independence to make your own sovereign choices. Yeah. And we are your allies in that endeavor. Yeah, that's great. John, I mean, corruption is a strategic advantage for certain kind of imperial projects to expand. Yes. Um, and as you said, you know, in a way, responsible governance is the best defense to maintain sovereignty. Uh, by responsible governance, we need we mean rulers and governors who are responsible to their people. Uh, how to promote uh, greater transparency in some of these uh, large financial deals that are uh, behind this new connectivity that's emerging, uh, particularly transparency that serves the larger political objectives of maintaining sovereignty? Right. Well, you know, I think too often we adopt uh, well, we go into a, a crouch. We adopt too defeatist uh, a point of view. Um, but in fact, there's already a lot of good news out there. Uh, a lot of these countries are starting to issue bonds in their own currencies. They do not depend exclusively on foreign capital. And what does that mean? Well, it means they need access, they want access uh, very much access to markets that greatly value transparency, greatly value sovereignty, an international, internationally stable order. Um, bankers don't like bullets yeah. at all. They don't even like to bank, with a few exceptions, they don't like to bank winning sides. They just don't like it. And I think that that is part of what we stand for um, and not just stand for, it isn't just soft power, but it is soft power crucially interlinked with what we do and one of the great powers that we bring to the world. So I think that really we, we have to work with what we already have right. um, and with what these countries want. I mean, they have suffered horribly in the recent past, the Asian financial crisis, that's still um, seared in their memories. This is what happens if you depend on foreign capital in foreign currencies. So they are, they are launching toward, uh, toward us, really. Um, and there is the political and ideological embrace of freedom, um, like you. How controversial should that be? Um, but there's also, you know, economic forces that are driving them in our direction, and we should leverage that. Thank you. Um, let me go ahead and open this up for a larger conversation. Uh, this gentleman here in the second row, and uh, when the microphone comes around, if you can identify yourself with your name and your affiliation, if you have one, and uh, please keep your questions short. We want to be mindful of everybody's time. Sir. Uh, thank you for the, all uh, great presentations. I'm Satoshi Nishiata, a uh, Washington rep rep uh, representative of uh, the Liberty and Happy Science Group in Japan. And uh, I think it is uh, very uh, clear, uh, considering the current situation of the Indo-Pacific region, 
uh, China is the most pressing and very important issue uh, due to its uh, very huge economic economical influence and also uh, its uh, authoritarian and non-democratic and non-rule-based uh, political system. And so there are two factors, economic system and political systems. And, and I've been, uh, and there's been a lot of uh, debate and uh, prediction about the collapse of Chinese economy, at least uh, since um, 10 years ago. Yeah. And I have been curious uh, about the prospect of uh, Chinese economy uh, regarding uh, this point. Uh, if anyone have a specific prospect for the future economy of uh, China, China's situation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hiroiki, would you like to take a stab at that? OK. Um, the economic aspect uh, about how well they are managing current economic situation. Maybe uh, we should uh, admit that they are doing relatively well. There are many predictions about the cross of Chinese economic growth, um, uh, economic economy, but uh, they are somehow managing very well. But uh, in long term, challenge is that the challenge is demographic change. Uh, they are due to the one-child policy. Uh, their uh, uh, working force is start to shrink, and also their demographic balance is very imbalanced. And also, uh, their sustainability of their economic uh, growth is also will be challenged by the uh, several other factors like pollution, or also widening income gap, and also uh, lack of uh, flow of information. Those all peculiar challenges that China is having, facing, due to the authoritarian capitalism. I think that, that they will, eventually they will have, they have to face whether they will proceed toward more liberal uh, political system, thereby they can uh, achieve the economic, sustainable economic uh, growth by uh, under that political system or stick with authoritarian political system which will eventually limit the uh, growth of economic growth under the liberal economy. So that will be the best challenge. John, do you have a short answer to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, you're exactly correct. I mean, for, what, seven, ten years, people have been saying that China would uh, blow up. I was one of those people. Uh, I was wrong. It didn't blow up. And many of the things, many of the problems people were pointing at, the rising debt levels, um, the enormous overcapacity in various industries, They've actually been managing those okay. The question, I think, for this discussion with OBOR is that requires fin enormous financial backing. Do they have the money for that? That's not so clear. And I think if, you know, people talk about China providing capital very quickly, you know, the, all of the examples I cited, they were providing some capital, but on very mean terms. They, so I, I think that is the question, not whether China will blow up, but whether they actually have the capital to sustain a project as huge as BRI. It, it would require so much money. I don't know if they have it. Yeah. And the hope and the expectation for so many years, of course, was that they would do exactly what Hiroyuki had described and, and undertake to reform the command Leninist capitalism that has structured their political economy at home and move in a more liberal direction. I think with the enshrining of BRI in the 19th, century, 19th Party Congress this past, uh, past October, it's become very clear, indisputably clear, that the Chinese Communist Party is not thinking that way right now. And that may yet change yet again, but not right now. Um, sir, in the back row, uh, this hand up. Thank you. Uh, Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. Uh, I'd like to address this to the two uh, Japanese presenters. Uh, I understand this concept of the, the east-west connectivity that's encouraged by Japan, and then the north-south, or trying to, to China-centric. 
but when I look at the Chinese plan, uh, they have such an integrated vision. I mean, all of this, they're going to have satellites up there. Everything is going to be controlled, uh, integrated. Artificial intelligence is going to be on there. But when I hear about the, the east-west connectivity, it seems like, oh, they'll have a little connection here, a little connection there. I mean, there's no massive in overall integration here, certainly not continent-wide. So how, how do you plan to, to, uh, to, to meet that uh, Chinese uh, massive level of uh, computerized integration? It's always smart to undersell and over-deliver. Hiroyuki. You're exactly right. Uh, now, what the Japan is, has been doing is uh, just uh, uh, developing uh, economic development assistance of each project. And uh, it has started with the idea that Japan have to contribute for sustainable economic development of Asian region. Um, but uh, what is happening right now is, as we discussed, uh, we have to have a broader context uh, that is the uh, rise of China and uh, China's BRI. So that is the why, reason why uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, came up with the idea of Indo-Pacific strategy. And in this context, tried to sort each project uh, together uh, to create more clearer strategic picture in which uh, each country, US, Japan, Australia, and India, and other country can cooperate each other by complementing each other. But it's just about to start. Thank you. Uh, sir, here in the second row. Uh... Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the quality of presentations. I'm uh, involved with UNESCO uh, in, in China and in Asia for restoration of cultural heritage and natural heritage, specifically for the Silk Road. Now, uh, one comment. You don't seem to mention or I did not hear about Europe and Russia in this equation. And this is fundamental. I'm French national, still French national, and I just read this morning uh, President of France commitment to a cooperation with China. So I think sooner or later one should integrate the, that part. But let's look at what I call co competition, cooperation and competition with China. In cultural and natural heritage restoration, Japan is very advanced. You'll have the first uh, cultural Olympiad in 2020. Uh, Japan is still young in international cooperation. I used to be involved quite a few years. So you should, I strongly recommend, to go beyond uh, confrontational. I, I'm aware of security. I'm not specialist at all yet. Where there is a win-win situation. China today needs a lot of competence, cooperation in everything related to cultural heritage, natural heritage, and there are huge projects, and according to your statistics in Japan, there one will create jobs. So to rebuild communities, to improve education, um, I think America and Japan they have unique resources, and they can deliver today. Right. So uh, this part, which is soft power, not security related, I would appreciate your comment. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, yes, uh, Abe, Prime Minister Abe and President Xi met in uh, Vietnam uh, in the framework of, uh, as a sideline of uh, APEC meeting last November. And in that meeting, uh, China clearly uh, proposed for both countries to expand complementary cooperation, which means uh, economic cooperation, especially focusing on how to deal with aging society, uh, like a medical system, a welfare system, pension system, and also how to deal with pollution. So they have realized that, that it is necessary for them to improve its re political relations with China and then Japan in order to sustain their economic growth and also maintain stability of the society. So in that sense, China understands the needs of that needs very well. But uh, as for Japan, Abe also is responded very positively. But at the same time, uh, there is, if there is a diversion at the strategic level, 
uh, tactical cooperation like that has limitation. China basically wants to replace U.S. primacy at, until 2049. They, you know, have this uh, official goal uh, set by the Party Congress, and Japan wants to maintain U.S. to maintain U.S. Like, order, liberal order in this region. So, strategic diversion will be the will limit the tactical cooperation, more or less. I'm not saying that it is impossible, but the strategic you know, divergence of goal is. Could I say something about Europe, please? Um, you know, one of the things I was emphasizing was if China is the largest and fastest growing accessible market, India may be faster growing, but as I say, it's harder to access. Then if, I, if it's the only game in town, it's the only game in town. Europe coming in in a more significant way, mm -hmm. I think, provides an interesting counterweight and could actually allow us to sort of use some of the resources of BRI um, to mitigate some of China's advantages, right? Because kind of the, you look at all these arrows, the other end of those arrows are European. So if we have more European trade, that's good for us. Um, so I, I agree that Europe is important and perhaps underappreciated. Uh, this gentleman in the front row here. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. To what extent can things be made more transparent to overcome the corruption by having things on the Internet when all these deals are put together? It's a great question. Um, Sounds like it answered itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think that that's precisely the kind of thinking and practical sorts of techniques that are required today. Um, I mean, we had had a wide-ranging discussion with uh, Satoru and, and uh, Mr. Dr. Akita uh, the other day about how countries that might be on the fence about this can involve themselves with the AIIB, for example, the Chinese investment bank that was set up to invest in infrastructure projects to, in a way, realize BRI. Um, at the end of the day, I think that that institution is largely driven by the political imperatives of the Chinese Communist Party. However, if there are Western nations that get involved in that bank, I'm not sure the United States will or should, but if there are Western nations, then playing a role in trying to raise the standards, uh, particularly anti-corruption standards, in how that bank operates would be absolutely key. Um, uh, but outside of that, transparency. Um, it's the best disinfectant uh, to corruption. Um, and corruption really is a national security problem, particularly when you're looking at, at, at all of the countries that we're talking about here. And I just say both India and Japan have shown some real leadership on this question. I mean, India yeah. before the Belt and Road yeah. Summit, Prime Minister Abe at the Nikkei Conference right mm -hmm. after it, where they both said, here are the conditions in which we could support these kind of enterprises. And it was transparency in contracting, government procurement, it was competitive tender, open bids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So that's a good starting point. But we should not forget that a, 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 actually a totalitarian uh, enterprise like China will not easily embrace transparency. Of course not. And so therefore, while the idea is great, the real question is, as you know, who will build the cat? Uh, who will get the major authoritarian player to accept the notion of transparency that essentially comes from free and open societies? Yeah. But we aren't, we, especially the U.S., aren't just sitting on our hands, right? We have, we have the Foreign and Corrupt Practices Act. That has real teeth. I mean, executives, executives of corporations go to jail if they violate that, and they have an affirmative duty to make sure that their counterparties are operating in an uncorrupt fashion. And we have worked very hard to bring European nations on board, France on board, um, and being locked out of that business network, those capital markets, that's a price. You know, maybe if you're Sri Lanka, you're already pretty locked out because you're small and nobody cares. But if you're a larger country of any significance, you're paying a price. 
Thank you. Um, sir, in the, toward the back there. Thank you. Uh, James Barnett here at the Hudson Institute. Thank you all for a terrific panel. Um, my question is really directed at Mr. Twining. I really liked what you said about Africa being the second most exciting development in the world right now. And I was wondering you, if you could link that to what you mentioned first, which was India. Um, we talk a lot about how China's predatory economic practices, what you guys have been describing here in Southeast Asia, very much applies in Africa. And I was wondering, do you think that increased Chinese investment across the continent could possibly be an antidote of sorts to some of the dangerous Chinese lending practices that are both, I, be, I believe, you know, contrary to American interests and often weaken local governance, contribute to corruption and such? Yes, thanks. I mean, there's a very African narrative about the new colonialism, right, which doesn't apply to all Chinese projects, but it applies to those which are natural resource extractive, which involve engagements with unelected leaders to build things like stadiums. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, you mentioned the uh, Indo-Japanese growth corridor, the African growth corridor. I mean, this is very interesting, right, because Japan and India both bring quite interesting equities to this question of how do you do leapfrog development uh, in some of these contexts. Um, more broadly, you know, I'm always struck by this kind of this scramble for resources because, of course, in the 21st century, what you win with is human capital. Uh, I was, it was most amazing uh, going back to Libya in the fall of Gaddafi when the Chinese extracted, exfiltrated 30,000 Chinese workers from Libya. And everybody sort of said, what are 30,000 Chinese workers doing in Libya extracting oil? You know, this Chinese, this previous Chinese approach, which has moderated a bit to kind of lock up resources through ownership, natural resources. So uh, I think there's a lot that both Japan and India can bring to the table there. I mean, the US through some of the MCC and other standards where we're doing quite smart modes of development that are not, you know, let's give Mutu Sese Seiko uh, suitcases of money. I mean, those days are long over, but kind of being smart in how we think about the governance aspect of development, because of course, you know the statistics, uh, which are that I grew up in Africa. Most Western European and American assistance to Africa during the Cold War was squandered. I mean, very little of it went into human capital formation, essentially, right? So again, I think for the democracies, this is the sweet spot, is kind of digitally connecting people, empowering them, including through soft infrastructure like education, right? Um, which is a very different model than going to Namibia to mine for something in the ground. And, and, and India itself has a human capital problem, so they have to develop their own human capital oh, yes. as well in the process. And, and that may be something that the democracies can cooperate uh, and work on in improving India's human capital capabilities so that, that that can also be an advantage uh, elsewhere. I want to be respectful of everybody's time and we're out of it. So one quick question, sir, here in the front row. Um, uh, Peter Humphrey, Intel analyst or former diplomat. Um, I note that uh, anti-corruption blockchain ledgers are not just for Bitcoin, could easily help us fight corruption. I just spent uh, a month in Kazakhstan, about a third of the products on their shelves were American products, including Captain Crunch and Whiskas Cat Food. Um, seems to me that one boat, one, one, one road, one belt will be delivering disproportionately American products. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted that a communist dictatorship is uh, subsidizing American trade. So I want to know why we're afraid of one road, one belt, when we will probably benefit to a considerable degree. I'm not sure we're afraid of it. I would just say, you know, I think there's a, there's a wider way to talk about this topic, which is China is trying to build a world around itself. And uh, parts of the world around China don't want to be part of any new sphere of influence, right? Including a country like Kazakhstan, which wants to have strong relations in many directions. And so I think the point is a little different, which is really about state capture and unlevel playing fields that it created. China is so big. Uh, and it just comes in in scale and displaces all sorts of existing balances. And that's a fact we're going to be living with in every country for the rest of our lives. Uh, in fact, in many respects, BRI can be seen as a success of the last 30 years of U.S. strategic policy. I mean, one of the unstated objectives of the United States Navy was to make the world safe for Chinese capitalism and for, and for deep Chinese-American trade. And now we've entered a period of PRC-led globalization um, uh, at a time when, in some respects, the U.S. is withdrawing um, from that whole process. 
um, this is setting the stage for something new. And without getting in place the political governance and strategic structures to ensure that the peace that has been sustained by this last 40 years of enormous economic you know, activity, without getting bolstering the structures that underpin that peace, it, this does have potential to go off the rails. But fear, I don't think, is, is what brings us together today. Um, it's trying to make sure that we continue to have more opportunities to deepen the peace, to deepen the possibilities for liberal politics, for decency, and to reduce the possibilities for erratic rule by an outside power that doesn't always have the interests of Asia foremost in mind, but rather the preservation of their own power at home foremost in their minds. So. With that, we will be convening many other panels going forward on this subject, and uh, we hope that you will all come back. But thank you all to our panelists, um, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thanks. Thank